uh, to this week's installment of our number theory web seminar. Um, just uh, the usual kind of uh, disclaimer. So uh, please, you're, you're strongly encouraged to ask questions. Uh, I think the best, uh, the best way we, we found to do that is to either raise your hand or ask something in the chat. And one of us will, will hopefully will check that out and, uh, and interrupt Peter. Uh, but without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce Peter Sarnak from Institute for Advanced Study and Princeton University, who will speak to us today on integer points on affine cubic surfaces. Peter. Thank you, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this. Uh, I looked at some of the previous lecture titles and, in fact, uh, the slides. Uh, looks like it's a fantastic success. And uh, let me say that my talk will intersect two of your recent lectures by Browning and by Drew Sutherland, uh, you will see as I go along, but I don't think that that's a negative, maybe it means the subject has some interest. Uh, and yeah, so let me start. Let me also make clear that I welcome, uh, I've given a few of these Zooms now, and uh, it's nice to actually know there's somebody there on the other side. Uh, sometimes I panic that maybe I, I don't know what I'm doing here and I'm just talking to myself. So feel free to interrupt, not just through chat, but just, uh, it's not interrupt, interact is the word. And so, all right, let me start. So this is all joint work with Amit Ghosh, the more recent work and some of the earlier work, which has still been worked out is with Alex Gumbard and Jean Bergen. Unfortunately, Jean Bergen died a few years ago, but Gumbard and I are still uh, working out or writing up some of these details. Uh, all right, so I'm going to talk about cubic forms, but before I do so, let me talk about, uh, let me set up the general problem. We are interested in Diophantine equations over the integers. We'll be looking for integer solutions, not so much rational solutions. Uh, there's a difference uh, when you're working over the rationals, things are a little better because you can divide and the theory is a little more complete. Every now and then you have groups where you wouldn't have if you just have integer solutions. But of course, they're very closely related. So this is sort of the difference in the case that I'm interested in in this lecture, only one equation between the homogeneous polynomial and the more general polynomial in n variables integral. And I'll assume that throughout f and f minus any k, because I'll be interested in an affine equation, f equals k, where k is also an integer. So I'll assume everywhere that f and f minus k are absolutely irreducible over the complex, because if it factorizes, the equation, of course, simplifies. Ah, I have some device, at least, to uh, point with. That's this little cursor. So uh, if, uh, if it reduces, especially if it factors over z, then you would have a product of two numbers equals k, and you would be able to study each factor separately. So I'll assume that everything's irreducible. So it already takes away, for example, the case of the Riechle's theorem, where you have a homogeneous form of degree n in n variables, which factors into linear factors. That is a model case, and uh, I will refer to it occasionally, but that's not what I'm interested in. here. So we look at the affine variety defined over whatever ring we're interested in, and we look at the set of x such that f of x equals k, that's this hypersurface, and we're interested in integer solutions. There's an obvious necessary condition, local congruence obstructions that allow us to study things uh, locally and studying the equation locally is much simpler. I'll get back to that for the kind of equation I'm interested in in a second. So of course if I have a solution of the integers, I have a solution modulo q for every q. And if and checking the solutions modulo q, especially for the kind of equations which are absolutely irreducible and at least in three variables, I'll be looking at cubics in three variables, uh, the condition, the local condition of whether you can solve modulo q uh, by the Chinese remainder theorem uh, simplifies tremendously and it just becomes a condition on arithmetic progressions so that this uh, equation f of x congruent to k modulo q which, of course, counting the number of solutions would give you, uh, if you do this over the extensions, field extensions, uh, Q, uh, P, P squared, and so on, would give you the local zeta function. Uh, but whether they're solutions or not is, is easy, as I say. So that if we're in the situation, any situation that we'll encounter, we will know 
what the local obstructions are, and we'll always impose them. And if we pass these local obstructions, then we uh, would be very happy if there's a global solution, and if there's a global solution, maybe many global solutions. So this is the lo local to global principle we're interested in. And uh, we say that uh, we have a Hasse principle, because this is based on our review Hasse's theorem in a second. Uh, we have a Hasse principle if the local obstructions, these trivial local obstructions are the only ones. So if you have a linear equation, let's dismiss that case immediately. So it's just a linear equation like that. Uh, linear form equals k. Then, of course, if you're going to be able to solve this over the integers, you better have the GCD of the a's divide k. And that's also sufficient. And once you have a solution, you have many solutions. So the linear equation is easy. But the quadratic equation is already as difficult as pretty much most things can get in the subject. Although we do understand this case. And I want to say, explain a little bit why we understand this. So if it's a quadratic equation to be solved over the integers in a number field or over the rationals in the number field, this was what Hilbert, this is a well-known Hilbert's 11th problem. He posed this after seeing, uh, putting together work of Smith and Minkowski. It's a difficult problem. He understood that class field theory, which was not, didn't exist at the time, but which he foresaw at that point by looking at quadratic extensions would play a big role in this. And the hasse minkowski theorem solves, as Hasse solved Hilbert's 11th problem in case A, the easy part of the problem, which is to solve, do you have a local to global principle for a quadric uh, when you are asked to solve this for rational numbers in a number field? And of course, the necessary condition is if you can solve it in rational numbers in the number field, you have to be able to solve it at every completion kv of k. And the converse is true, and that's the beautiful hasse minkowski theorem. The case of the integers, so like which numbers are sum of three squares over a number field, is much, much harder. And Siegel spent a tremendous effort to solve uh, Hilbert's 11th problem over in rings of integers. The Siegel mass formula was born out of this. He made tremendous progress on it. Of course, he had to start off with the hasse principle to get started, but the answer is much more difficult. In the case that you have uh, quadratic equations, quadrics in two variables, binary quadratic forms, that's really class field theory that's understood through the theory of fields. But once you get to three variables, it's already very difficult. And Siegel was able to do it in five variables. He actually developed the hardy Littlewood circle method. I'll return to that in a minute in order to do that. Knezer found a very beautiful treatment of four variables in the slightly weaker forms. So you can't expect a local to global principle over a number field, especially for definite quadratic forms. Uh, that is that you can solve for every k if and only if there are no local integral obstructions. But you can demand that that be true if k is large outside some well-known exceptions. And that's sort of a stable local to global principle. And that's known now all the way down to three variables. And that's the work of Siegel, Knezer, Duke Ivanich made a very important breakthrough, and Kogdal, Piotrowski, Shapiro, and myself were able to settle this. Uh, and the reason that three, three variables is the critical and hard case here, and the reason that one uh, can solve that, so four variables or five variables, as I said, Siegel already was doing with the circle method. Four variables can be handled by a method that I'll return to Klostermann's. Uh, improvement or development of the circle method allowed you to do, deal with four variables even over a number field today. But three variables, the only way we know how to deal with it is to use the full force of modular forms. There is a theory of theta functions which connects the, uh, the solvability of, of uh, f of x equals k by making modular forms. So the important thing about uh, a quadric which is f of x equals k, where x is a quadratic form, is that it's a homogeneous space for orthogonal group. And it's that extra piece of algebra that it's got the symmetry of an orthogonal group underlying it that allows you to bring in modular forms through theta functions. And then the, the, the techniques that are required to prove this on highly non-trivial. But that's the feature that allows you to understand quadratic forms. So I worked on that many years ago, and I've now uh, been working on the case of cubics. 
And cubics are much, much more difficult, especially over the integers. We essentially know nothing in uh, three variables, which is the case I want to talk about, but let me review what we do know in many variables. So I'm going to stick to affine cubic, not homogeneous, as I said, and the reason is I would love to stick to homogeneous only and deal with rational points on cubic forms, but I have nothing to say there in terms of any new methods. I'll review what is known. So I will have to allow, because the case that we're going to study in great depth is not going to be a homogeneous polynomial. It'll have lower order terms. But the leading part, I always want to be cubic. I want it to be non-degenerate, so it should involve all the variables. That's what I mean by non-degenerate here. And I'll assume, as before, that f and f minus k are absolutely irreducible. And we look at the level sets, this affine hypersurface, and we ask when k is admissible. And in this case, really, the condition on local solvability is simply that k lies in a progression. We'll see this in every example that we look at. It's a general fact that follows from Langevé uh, theorem very easily. And the question we're interested in uh, is to produce points, not to show there aren't any points. And the production of integer solutions or rational points more generally for algebraic varieties is very limited. We don't have many tools. And that's why the subject, even examples are very interesting. So I'm interested in the case that it's rich, that we may have a local to global principle, a Hesse type principle. And if the number of solutions is non-empty, in other words, we do have an integer solution, then uh, do we have infinitely many? Are they a risky dense? And are they rich enough to even satisfy some form of strong approximation? So strong approximation means that we have enough solutions. So we're looking at VKFZ. We're looking at this affine variety. And we ask, can we actually, so, uh, if you give me a local solution, so you give me a solution modulo Q, does it come from a global solution? That's what strong approximation asks. So is it possible that the solutions are so rich that not only do we have a Hasse principle, but we really have many, many solutions enough to cover all local solutions. All right, so we're looking at a cubic form. And I'm going to talk about cubic forms in three variables, and that's because that's the critical threshold and by far the most difficult case and for which we know almost nothing. If we look at a cubic form in two variables, so if let's say it's irreducible over Q, so it doesn't fit into what I had before because it factors over C, but let's say it doesn't factor over Q. So we're looking at a binary cubic form. Then there's a famous theorem of Tour Ziegel that the number of solutions is finite. So in that case, we're certainly not gonna have a rich number of solutions. And the, I'll return to heuristics in a minute, but it's clear why there are very few solutions. And Schmidt even shows by extending to a Ziegel's method for this kind of equation, it doesn't have to be degree three, it can be any degree. And not only is it finite, but for most Ks, so if we fix F and we vary K, which is what I'm interested in, for most Ks, there are actually no solutions. And for most Ks, in a very serious sense, all but K, in this case, K to the two thirds. And if you look at the local obstructions uh, in this case, which are a bit trickier than in the case of more variables, because they can be local obstructions, it's easy to compute what they are. And the number of Ks which are admissible is still, the number of Ks up to capital K, which are admissible is still capital K over log K, roughly, while the number of cases for which it's empty is much, much larger. So you certainly don't have any uh, hazard type principle in this case, and I'll call that the supercritical case. So the cubic forms in two variables, we understand they're very, they're very few solutions. So let's allow many variables. Perhaps the strongest theorem that's known today is the theorem of Browning and Heath-Brown. I'll call this the subcritical. This is where we have many variables. And that is, let's allow these non-homogeneous cases. So if the uh, F naught, the homogeneous part is non-singular, and we only look, of course, at admissible K, then we will always have an integral solution, and the integral solutions will be the risky dense, and you'll have full force of strong approximation. The point is that in, the, in proving this, they're essentially proving it by the circle method. So the, the circle method of Hardy and Littlewood is a harmonic analysis method to solve these kind of equations. And if the number of solutions is extremely large, so let's try and understand how many solutions there are. We're looking at fx1, f is cubic. 
So if I look at fx1 up to xn, if I have n variables and I let the x's go up to b, say, in size, I will have b to the n numbers. When I f transforms any one of these numbers, which uh, in each coordinate is at most b, since it's cubic, the number will be at most b cubed in order of magnitude. So that means that we are filling boxes, b cubed boxes, by b to the n points, b, b to the n elements in the domain of this f. And so if the world were fair, modulo the local obstructions, each box would get roughly uh, b to the n minus 3. So if n is bigger than 3, there should be a lot of solutions, at least on average, and maybe the world is nice, and each guy that's supposed to be hit, except for the congruence obstruction, is hit. And when the circle method works, it proves that. And not only does it prove it, it proves that every kind of feature that you want of this nature is true. So that's in the subcritical case, but we need a lot of variables. And of course, a lot of the work in the subject is reducing the number of variables, especially if you're using something like the circle method. Hooley, before he passed away uh, also, maybe a year ago, uh, I think this is the last paper that maybe of his that's published at this point, I'm sure more will be on the way, showed the kind of, he explored the kind of question that I want to explore for cubics in three variables, and that is, he got down to four variables, but not being able to deal with any F, but to deal with, uh, not to be able to deal with uh, every K, but to deal with almost every K. So the question is, is it true that almost every admissible K is actually represented by F? And you can uh, apply a technique, which he developed in many contexts, which is to compute the variance of the number of expected number of solutions from the number of solutions. Then uh, you double the number of variables when you compute this variance. And then you into eight variables, which is getting closer to your 10 variables where the circle method works. And where he'd actually showed that if you assume the Riemann hypothesis for certain passive AL functions that intervene in his method, then uh, you actually do get this almost all result. Uh, Heath, I uh, mean, Browning, sorry, yeah. Does almost all here mean? Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 okay. This is very, <laughs> <laughs> you can see Bjorn, who's uh, both an algebraist and an analyst. Uh, yeah, if I'm talking almost all, it's all, but uh, density one, so it's in the sense of density, okay. that's a much weaker result, yes, of course. Uh, I should also add that, when you produce a point by this method, by this averaging method, you produce a point, but you don't produce infinitely many points on any one of these Fs, uh, or any one of these Ks. In the same, uh, there's a recent work which actually was presented to the seminar by Browning, by his work with Labudek and uh, Sowen, where you average not over the values that an F takes, but you value, uh, average of, he's looking at the projective case and rational points, but he averages over the moduli space of Fs. That's a very big averaging, and again proves that you have a Hesse principle. In the case, which is similar to this in the sense that we expect many solutions. So this averaging method will maybe produce a point, but it never produces as a risky dense set of points, because you don't, as you increase your parameter space of, of which you're averaging, you produce points on the different on different varieties and not points. Nobody knows how to produce them all on the same variety. So in this case, where I fix f and vary k, or in this Hooley case, you don't get for any f that you actually have more than some finite number of points, but you do get a Hasse principle for almost all level sets for f under this strong assumption if you have four or more variables. So the cubic case is the uh, case which is by far the hardest. So two, we have very, very few solutions. I explained heuristically why uh, we would expect here, if we look at balls, uh, boxes of size B, that they're only going to be B to the zero number of solutions. So you're going to be, if you're going to hit, you're going to hit maybe finitely many times. And this bodes poorly for analysis. So it's going to be kind of tough. You may be able to circumvent that difficulty in a way that I'll explain in a minute. But what I would love to say something about, I have nothing to say, and people, there was a lecture on this also in the last month in the seminar, 
Here's the sum of three cubes. That would be the ideal problem. But this is an extremely difficult problem. Uh, by the way, we're allowing x to be negative here. Yeah? If you put x to be positive, the problem, uh, that would restrict the values. And it's very easy to see this. Uh, even almost all result is not true. It's not true that almost all k's are sum of three positive cubes. There just are not enough points around to fill the boxes. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah. It requires a little bit of an argument, but it's not difficult. Anyway, as I promised, that in any of these uh, cubic problems, uh, the condition that you're admissible is very easy to determine. You had two, it shouldn't be four, five, mod nine. And if you're not four, five, mod nine, as far as the mankind knows, you probably, uh, it's possible that you always do have a solution. We don't have any tool to produce solutions. We don't have any tool to produce almost all cases, I'm afraid, in this case. So one goes to the computer. And I'll tell you what's known in a minute, in a minute. but the uh, talk of Sutherland explained very beautifully the breakthrough by Booker, who used the method of Elkies, and then uh, Sutherland, uh, as far as I can see, explained much, in much more detail this method. There was a, the first number that was not known to be a sum of three cubes, but which could have been a sum of three cubes was 33. And as you can see, the solutions are very sparse. So this is the, was the first solution that Booker found last year. And then he with Sutherland have found many more solutions, including a solution for 42. You might ask, what are these numbers 33 and 42? They're the first that weren't seen, but there's a reason that they weren't seen, as I'll explain in a second. So these are found by a computer. They don't produce more than one solution. Uh, they may look for more and find more solutions. But it's a very difficult problem. There's no local obstruction. Nobody's found an algebraic obstruction. There's one case where we know something a little more. There's a very beautiful uh, theorem of Lehmer, developed further by Boykers, which you can show that for the equation equals one, sum of three, cube, uh, three cubes equals uh, one, uh, of which you can put two equal to zero and one, uh, that these solutions are dense by very clever use of Pell's equation. Uh, I don't want to go into it, but it's the one case where the level set is not only got a solution, but it's got a dense set of solutions for the sum of three cubes. P perhaps the best theoretical thing we know about sum of three cubes starts with an observation of castles using uh, cubic reciprocity to show that the strong approximation for these sum of three cube problems uh, must fail at least for some congruence class. In fact, I would suggest maybe there's only one congruence class or limited number of congruence classes for which it fails, but there always at least one congruence class. And this was observed first by Castles for uh, the right-hand side being three. So if you have a solution to x1 cubed plus x2 cubed plus x3 cubed equals three, then uh, the solution has to have satisfy a congruence modulo nine, which is not locally forced on you. So this is a failure of strong approximation, and it shows that the solutions to the sum of three cubes equals three are gonna be rather sparse because they're restricted to certain arithmetic progressions. This uses cubic reciprocity, and Kolyot and Wittenberg uh, realized this obstruction that Castles found using cubic reciprocity by Brouwer groups for the surface. And that's a very important advance because when you just found obstructions as uh, many people might uh, uh, by some trick here or there, uh, you don't limit what you are doing. So when you understand that all certain uh, families of counter examples of a certain type, you also know the limit of what you can do. And when you find something which doesn't fit in that category, you've learned something. So Kolyot, Helen, and Wittenberg explain uh, that strong approximation will always fail for the sum of three cubes equals a number, admissible number, uh, in some congruence class um, uh, using this uh, brouwer manian obstruction. And uh, they, however, never have found an example which would actually uh, violate the Hasse principle. So as far as we know, I repeat, every number which is not four or five modulo nine might well be a sum of three cubes. And not only might it be a sum of three cubes, but these, high, these uh, level sets might be Zariski dense for all we know. And you can conjecture one way or the other, and I don't think anybody will prove, one, disprove you or prove anything uh, unless they have some really big new idea. So with that said, and having spoken for 25 minutes, I now will turn to what I wanted to talk about. 
And that's some very special cubic surfaces that I've been working with uh, Bogan and Gumbard and Amit Ghosh of the last eight years or so. And my one excuse for looking at special cases is we really don't have exotic uh, equations, enough exotic equations, but in which we can say something non-trivial and for which... Uh, the Sorry, what? Is there a question? Can, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Please continue. Yeah, you can hear me, okay. So I must carry on. Okay. Uh, I don't want everybody to be moved off into the waiting room. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so let me get back here. Yeah. So I'm gonna talk about Markov uh, cubic-like surfaces. This is a family of surfaces, cubic surfaces. They're not homogeneous for which uh, there are many viewpoints and many different tools that can be used. And because of that, we can say something non trivial so let me introduce you to the basic case. So the cubic form is sum of three squares minus the product of three numbers. So it's something very special, and we're going to see very many properties that allow us to look at it from many different points of view. Again, I'm looking at the level sets. Same question. I will single out two cases here. The Markov surface itself, he looked at the case where k was zero, and there was an, and there's a number three. I'll return to that a bit later. And k equals four, which is the Cayley cubic, which is very important in the theory of cubic surfaces, because this is the surface that Cayley used to prove the 27 lines on a cubic. Uh, but we have this one parameter, k, that's our level sets, and we want to look at the Diophantine uh, solutions to it. So Markov looked at this first. He uh, studied it in connection with that, what's called the Markov spectrum and approximations of uh, quadratic thirds, how well you can approximate them, very closely connected to the Lagrange spectrum, and he connected the two. There's a very beautiful paper by Frobenius explaining Markov's ideas, and if you look at Frobenius's paper, you will pretty much see the modern view on the subject. Uh, Harvey Cohen in the 60s uh, observed the connection between the Markov solution to the Markov equation and simple closed geodesics on a congruent subgroup of the modular surface. So a uh, connection between closed geodesics, hyperbolic geometry, and integer solutions of the Markov equation. And I will use that connection indirectly later. Uh, the uh, Markov equation comes up in um, algebraic geometry in work of uh, Rud Rudakov and Gorenstev, and even there's a paper on the archive just two days ago uh, by Cotti and Varchenko on the Markov equation for Laurent polynomials, a star Markov equation where they introduce a star operation and involution, uh, where you're trying to solve the Markov equation in polynomials, Laurent polynomials, and that's very much connected to this algebra geometric work of Rudakov. There are other cases, there's a, the Markov equation comes in uh, left shift vibrations as an obstruction work of Dennis Aru, but the most important to me will be that the Markov equation comes up as the relative character variety, and this is how we'll generalize it, and I'll explain at the end, of uh, representations of the character variety, so this is up to conjugation, of representations of the once punctured torus into two by two matrices. I'll return to that. And that's a viewpoint that's extremely important. It brings in uh, this hyperbolic closed geodesics is also very important because it brings other tools and that's exactly what I like about this problem is that we can uh, use the circle method, but we can also use other tools and even combinatorics to try attack the problem of the richness of the integer solutions. It, the Markov also uh, equ equation uh, uh, arises in uh, algebraic classification of monodromic groups of plane of A6. This I won't use other than to point out one of the theorems that we proved uh, due, uh, was already proved earlier by De Broven and Mats Matsoko in this connection when I get there. All right, uh, so that's the Markov equation. Uh, what does the surface look like? So as I said, the case of k equal to zero is the Markov equation itself. So here are the real points drawn in a picture. 
of the level set V0 for this K. So in V0, there's a point, the origin is a solution. If you remember the equation, and then there are four components at this, this is V0. There are four components which are the same, and that's what the solution set looks like for V0. As you change K, so if you increase K from zero to two, the zero, the component, the solution, which was just a point at the origin grows to a little ball here, little compact set. So there are four pieces like that with a compact set. Then as you increase in K is four, they all just touch exactly with a conic singularity. That's the very special case K equals four. Everything I say for K equals four is false. It's the reason that Kaylee liked that case. It's a very simple case. Uh, it's almost linearizable, so to speak. And when K is bigger than four, then these all connect up into something like that. So that's what the real points of the Markov equation look like. And the reason one can study VKZ, so remember we were trying to look at the solutions to the Markov equation of the integers, is there's a group acting on the surface and it allows us to do descent. This group is already used by Markov and it, in any one of these interpretations, of the uh, Markov equation as a parameter space of something or as a moduli space of something, this group comes up naturally in its own way. But the group can be described very easily. Uh, it's a group of uh, automorphisms, polynomial maps of affine three space, which preserve the surface. And that's very easy to see that if I take, the easiest way to think of it is if I take the Markov equation, M equals, to k, and if I fix two of the coordinates there, say I'm making k equal to zero, if I fix x2 and x3 and I look at x1, and I have a, happen to have an integer solution, then the integer solution is, an integer, is a solution of a quadratic equation. You use high school algebra, the leading coefficient is one, so if you use a formula for quadratic equation, the conjugate solution is also an integer solution, so you get a map which takes you from an integer solution to an in integer solution, which is this Galois involution. And that map I call the R3, the one which, and you work out what it is, so it fixes x1 and x2, and it flips x3 into x1, x2 minus x3. That's a nonlinear transformation, and that uh, looks harmless at the first step, but when I start to iterate R3 and R1 and start mixing them up, I get a very complicated non-abelian group the group generated by that and all the permutations, for example, is just PGL2Z abstractly as a group. And it acts on, this, on these uh, level sets and it preserves integers. So it takes integer points to integer points. And that's the reduction that allows us to study the integer points on this Markov equation, which we can't do, for example, without any great new idea for some of three cubes. Can so as I said, when K is four, uh, everything I say is false, so ignore k equals 4. It's a much simpler case, it's a singular case. And otherwise, VKC consists of finitely many orbits. This so really goes back to Markov, Hurwitz, model. They just observed that if you start off with any solution, you can make it smaller by using one of these three involutions, and then you reduce, that's your descent, and you get into a, some finite compact piece, and hence you have um, VKZ has got a finite number of orbits and uh, if nothing else you also have a decision procedure to decide whether uh, Markov equals K has an integer solution or not and of course if it has a solution then you'll have many more solutions by iterating by using this very large potentially large group the groups large but acting seriously on the variety uh, so we don't even have a procedure for uh, sum of three cubes equals k, but we certainly have here, and this descent is what allows us to say something. So let me call hk the number of different solutions, just something like uh, orbit count or class number. I, I use the same notation because we'll see um, it's motivating how I'm thinking here. So if hk is positive, is VKZ infinite? So is it a risky dense? Very likely since we can start with a point and then move around unless we stuck in some little closed small orbit. If it's a risky dense, do we have strong approximation? Are the solutions to this Markov equation, which is a cubic, very rich once there is a solution? These are the questions that we've been trying to understand. Peter, may I please interrupt you for a yes. moment? There is a question, please, from Sheriar Sikander. Would you please ask your question? Ah, thank you. 
I was just wondering if one can think of this group gamma as the mapping class group of the surface uh, one one sigma one one. Absolutely, I'll return to that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And just one more point. How so? Maybe you'll also talk about this. But how does the parameter k enter in the relative character variety in the definition? It's of the, the trace of the boundary component. It's a trace. So if uh, so, you're fixing I'll the conjugacy uh, class. I'll end off by explaining this in general. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good, good question. Um, all right, so for all k, which, so again, uh, it's given by progression. So if k is not 3 mod 4 or plus or minus 3 mod 9, those are the case for which there's an obstruction. Otherwise, there's no local obstruction. There are no uh, obstructions periodically. And so we'll restrict to k's which are admissible and only those. And for k small, you've got this reduction. You can work out what, what's, what's going on. So uh, I'll return to k equals 0, the Markov case. He found there was one orbit there only. That's his famous Markov tree. But let me first remove some trivial points that exist. So if uh, you on for in some k, you have a solution where x, where one of the coordinates is either 0, 1, or 2. And if, if you have such a solution, k is already determined because uh, if you fix one of those coordinates and then you ask what can k be, then you're looking at a binary quadratic, a, a quadric in two variables. And that, of course, we have a complete theory for. And so uh, I'll remove these uh, special, easy to describe solutions they, uh, without loss of understanding. Uh, and we'll call the solutions generic. And in our work with Ghosh, Ghosh found something very, very beautiful. And if there's nothing else you take away from this lecture, you take away that there's the Gauss fundamental domain that everybody knows for the modular group, and there's the Amit Ghosh fundamental domain for, the, for this. It's as beautiful, and this is the film, that if K is positive, it's a little trickier when K is negative. A generic, you want to find all the solutions, so you can do this reduction, and the, the set of solutions is very much like Gauss reduced. So you, you, we say it's Gauss reduced. The solution is minus x1, x2, x3, lying on vkz. If you can bring it into the form where x1 is less than or equal to x2, less than or equal to x3, greater or equal to 3. And of course, it satisfies the Markov equation. I've got a minus x1 there. And the observation of Gauss, which is very beautiful, is that you have one element inside this for every orbit. In other words, the uh, class number that I called HK is exactly equal to the number of solutions in this region, and that's a finite region, and it's very easy then to numerically compute HK for any K, which he did, and uh, we used it immediately theoretically. So using that, one can prove that H of K, the number of orbits under this Markov or mapping class group, as it was pointed out, is at most K to the third. And the most important thing we observe, number two here, is that on average, so if I average either through positive k's or negative k's, the average value of the number of distinct orbits is growing like log k squared. And I'm going to return to this. This is the driving force of the main theorem. And that it means that the, for a typical k, there are more and more solutions. And this allows us to at least be in the situation where these other averaging, where we want to maybe prove a local to global for almost all K. Uh, remember I said that if we take a box of size length B, we'll hit each person a bounded number of times. But this is saying that these class numbers are growing, at least on average, slowly, log K squared. So there's a chance to do some kind of theorem which says that almost all K uh, have, uh, the Hazard principle is true, and once we have such a, a, a point, then we can start to use the group to become the risky dense, which something, so we use everything that's available. From the numerical experiments, we, we found that the number of k's up to k for which the Hazard principle, we only was talking about admissible k's, of course, for which a Hazard principle fails, is roughly k to the point nine. So they are a tremendous number, but still zero density failures from the numerics. And that's what we set out to prove. Here's an example of, there's the fundamental domain of Gauche inside that triangle there, and you count so that H of K is six, I think, in this example. And here's our main theorem that uh, we have proved and still busy refining in, as I'll explain at the end. So firstly, 
as the numerics indicated, there are infinitely many hazard failures, and we are able to prove that by using reciprocity. So we found a, a obstruction which only produced k to the half over log k hazard failures. Well, I told you that it appears to be k to the 0.9 has a failure, so we're certainly not explaining all of them, and that's a warning that algebra or these Brouwer-Mannian type obstructions, which I'll return to in a second, are not decisive, but they at least give something. And the main theorem that we prove is that almost all uh, k's, h of k is positive. In fact, h of k goes to infinity, gets larger and larger for almost all k's, so that means that the Hasse principle is true for k admissible for almost all k's. That's the analog theorem that we've seen when you have many solutions, but here uh, we're only growing like log when we set it up, and we're still able to prove this in three variables, so we're uh, quite satisfied with that, and that's uh, establishing what we saw numerically. All right, the hazard principles we found uh, all come from the, uh, it couldn't be explained by the Cayley cubic, modulo some prime, uh, but uh, they use quadratic reciprocity. Colliot Thelen and co-worker De Shang and Xu and also Lochran and Nankin independently have shown that uh, the examples that we're showing uh, via, our, via our quadratic reciprocity that uh, uh, fail has a principle can all, half of them I should say, can be explained this is the beauty of the Brouwer Manin, is it also limits what you can do. They explain all the examples that can be explained by Brouwer Manin, and they are essentially half of, of our examples. The other half combine that kind of argument with descent, which Brouwer Manin does not build in descent. So they can explain all our examples, if you like, by using descent and Brouwer Manin, and that's, uh, I think, very important that they explain it conceptually and not just that we produce these examples. Uh, but I repeat again that there are many more failures indicating that we should be very, very nervous about a sum of three cubes hitting every number. It may be that you can't explain the failure by some simple uh, obstruction which involves reciprocity, which the Brouwer Manin and our examples are of that nature. Let me say not a word about the Brouwer Manin obstruction, but our proof that of the almost all, because that's kind of subtle and I think uh, maybe hasn't been looked at that much. Is we have, uh, because the, if we restricted the variable, say, to be positive, then we would hit every number, bounded number of times, and you could never prove almost all. We need this log growth or some kind of growth. And that we do by taking certain tentacled regions where the number of points is growing uh, using this uh, gauche fundamental domain, we, the number of points is growing slowly like a log, and then we have to, and because it's growing, the number of diagonal solutions, which when you're looking at cubic form in three variables is already a significant number, is just washed away so that we can get rid of it, and it becomes technically very tricky, especially to control the diagonal. So there's a calculation of the expected number of solutions, and we take the difference, we square it, we get to a, a cubic form in six variables, but the cubic form is mx minus my, of course, and we have the luxury in, the, in that situation of fixed, and this part doesn't use any uh, of this uh, um, uh, Markov group. This part is just uh, using um, geometry, uh, if you like, it's not the circle method, but it boils down at some point to the circle method, meaning we fix two small variables to make a tentacle, something that you should be doing with the sum of three cubes as well, by the way. And we are able to analyze when you fix two of the variables, the situation that it arises properly because we can deal with quadratic forms, quadrics in four variables, which is we have six variables, two of them are fixed, which we're going to make very small. And then we have to see uh, how many solutions there are in a region compared to what Hardy Little would predict. And Klosterman's methods allow you to do that, especially in its modern incarnation. Uh, to control the diagonal, the Klosterman method or any such theory is not strong enough. And we actually have to get into divisor theory uh, and uh, count the number of divisors. And there's a very beautiful paper of Granville and Bloma, which uh, does the pre preliminary stuff that we need. Uh, so it's quite delicate, uh, the main theorem here. 
part two. And it's uh, a case where we don't have many solutions and we're only averaging on one parameter, but we're still able to do it because of the special, special structure of mx minus my. And it applies to uh, such uh, cubic forms, which uh, we've identified in the paper what that feature is. All right, in the remaining time, I want to talk about the richness, which is the work that I've been doing much longer, uh, over a longer period with Bogan and Gumba. This is where we started. And suppose that we already know that VKZ is non-empty. So we have one point, and now we want to say, gee, I've got one point, I've got a tremendous number of points. And here's where the mapping class group and all the geometry is going to come in. I'll stick to the Markov case. The general case is quite a bit more complicated, but can be understood completely. And let me explain why. Uh, one thing that uh, we're going to do is we're going to start with an integer solution on one of these level sets and then apply these Markov moves to make new integer solutions. Uh, I hope, uh, Michael, can you hear the lawnmowers? <laughs> this is the trouble with Princeton in the morning is your neighbors always got lawnmowers going and uh, I just it didn't occur to me that this could be a problem. <laughs> uh, they are outside here. Yeah, I certainly hear them. Okay. As long as you don't hear them, that's fine. Uh, so getting back to uh, this orb, these orbits. So if you have uh, a point on the, one of these uh, VKs, and you start applying these mark of moves, you have to make the takes integer points, integer points. So you would imagine you're going to be the risky dance. Your enemy is you might be stuck in a finite orbit. Maybe this is a finite orbit for this action on F3 so all of a sudden you need to know what are the finite orbits in characteristic zero of the Q bar because anything that appears in characteristic zero will appear by the Shabatari theorem uh, of a finite field of P for many P's. So we have to face that. And so we have to classify what the finite orbit of the action of this mapping class group are on our finite free space. And what we did, and for that, we used one of my favorite theorems, Lang's GM conjecture, which which was solved by, uh, we, we only need the torsion part of that, which is much simpler, but the full conjectures was solved by Laurent, Michel Laurent in the 80s. We use that to make this classification, it's not living room. But it was kind of, to me, I couldn't believe that nobody had looked at this because there are many uh, people who work in Kleinian groups to study the action of the Markov uh, mapping class group on the character variety, as it's so called. And they know it's very complicated. They look at much more things, but somehow they had not identified the finite orbits, which are absolutely critical. But the the Brovin and Machoko, Machoko it should be, uh, did actually determine this, and they, uh, it was to me quite shocking. How did they do this? These are two mathematical physicists. How did they do this without using Lang GM? Well, it turns out that they 
uh, found an old paper of Kronecker where he gives a proof of the classification by Schwartz of hypergeometrics with finite monodromy. This is a nonlinear version. This pain love is a nonlinear version of that. And this uh, proof of Schwartz's theorem by Kronecker uh, uh, uses roots of unity, not by, by um, the proof is by uh, let me note as advisor uh, uh, Gordon, Gordon Gordon, from Clutchton, Gordon, sorry, but it uses work of chronic. Huh? And uh, if you look at that carefully, you'll see that that work actually has the roots. Uh, that probably is the first step towards a proof of language GM long before anybody else. Uh, in this uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, were, was, was looking at it. So they found this proof and they found the finite orbits. And if you want to state whatever I'm about to state for arbitrary k, you must take into account those finite orbits. Let me say, take the case K is zero, and I'll put a three here because that's really exactly Markov's equation. Let me restrict to that. Then the moods are not what I had before, but there's the three over there. And then Markov's big theorem is that the integer solutions to this equation, yes, especially if all coordinates are positive, have one root, uh, one orbit. So there's the zero, 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 that's one orbit, that's special orbit. We, of course, remove it. I'll put the star to show the removed it. And then all other integer solutions are gotten from this one solution. And the problem we're interested in is do we have strong approximation? So I look at all the integer solutions mod P. I look at all the integer solutions period. I know that all these integer solutions, y star z, must be gotten by using the mapping class group uh, or this Markov group. So I have, this, I, if I start with one, 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 I must, I'll be, that's how I'm going to get to every solution. I work modulo P, I can count how many solutions there are, they're about P squared. And if I reduce modulo P, this uh, Markov or mapping class group acts as a permutation group on this finite set of solutions. A strong approximation is completely equivalent to this group acting, uh, this permutation group acting transitively. And that's uh, something that we conjecture is true for every P and uh, in the general K case for every sufficiently large P. There are counterexamples for small 
P is something that stabilizes when P gets large. Yeah, one can check for small P that this is true. Uh, this action is transitive. And this is uh, the big uh, problem, big conjecture that we have that we first looked at numerically uh, is that the Markov group is acting as richly as possible. The, should be acting transitively. And as long as we can prove this conjecture, as long as P squared minus one is not very smooth. So there's an enemy uh, difficulty in our proof to prove it completely. So we have an approximate result. And this is the main theorem, two theorems. Theorem, the first theorem is that if you look at the solutions Y star P, there is an orbit, a giant orbit, whose complement is at most size P to the epsilon. So the number of solutions mod P is P squared. When we look at the connected components acting by this permutation group, and there's always one massive giant component. That's our starting point. The giant component is at most of the giant component that must be to the epsilon point. And any, and this uses the characteristic zero argument, any uh, component must grow with P at least like log P to the one Improving these is very important because it might allow to completely resolve this uh, strong approximation conjecture, which we've only proved for all but very few p. And Konyagin and co-workers, Barolinsky, uh, have Improved, uh, improved this bound. They uh, improved from P to the epsilon to exponential log and, the lo and improved the exponent and the low bound. And in a very recent paper that I just got a few weeks ago, they've improved this exponential log to log P to the A under some natural conjecture. And that uh, is very important because it starts to maybe allow you to circle this whole wagon and maybe prove the strong approximation without any exceptions. But this still remains seriously open and I happy that I can talk on this uh, public platform to popularize this problem. Anyway, Bergen, Gambit, and I were able to use this to prove that the strong approximation conjecture uh, fails for very few p. So the number of p's up to t for which it's not true is at most t to the epsilon. And that's already enough for many of the applications we had in mind, but the real truth is we want to know that this group really acts handsomely on 
in these finite states. Uh, and in fact, the real problem is to act on the periodics rather than uh, periodic integers. So there's a nice uh, theorem uh, using finite group theory uh, from last year, Mary and Kuda, which say that if P is one of the P's for which we prove that, that we are transitive on these uh, not on these solutions mod P, and you ask what permutation group are we actually looking at? So it's a transitive permutation group, and there are all theorems in finite group theory which ensure that transitive permutation groups which act triply or doubly transitively uh, are really big. And they use that to show that if P is one mod four, then automatically uh, this act, the, the group is the full symmetric group of the alternating group and you can tell which one it is very, very easily. So not only is uh, it acting transitively but it's massive but they have to assume P is one mod four and unfortunately we don't know how to do that without that. And they also show that uh, the action is minimal on the periodic integers. So when you look at this uh, Markov or mapping class group acting on the periodic solutions, which are integral, then uh, it's apparently very minimal action, meaning every orbit wants to be dense, and that's uh, what you can prove by putting all these things together, at least the piece one mod four. And in fact, Bergen, Gambit, and I can prove this without putting piece one mod four, but just look at the last one. Um, why do I say that this is very useful? Uh, there's this beautiful theorem of Gossard, which is the, the notion of relatively prime group. Suppose that I want to get the strong approximation for products of integers rather than just P's themselves. Suppose I know it for the in, for P's, and I want to get it for the product. Uh, Gambit and Bergen and I found a way to do the product by uh, developing our methods, which I haven't explained at all uh, in this context. But there's a have, once you know the group is one of the alternating or the symmetric group, you can use finite group theory rather beautifully as follows. Suppose I want to prove I'm onto the product. So what I know is I have a subgroup of the product of groups. And the question is if I have a subgroup of product of groups which project onto each factor, onto each factor. Is it true that that subgroups the whole product? Well, if it was Z mod M, Z, and Z mod N, Z, if M and N are relatively prime, then this is automatic. 
but how do you make relatively prime at the level of finite groups? No one says there is such a theory, it's called Gossard's lemma. You have a subgroup of G cross H, which projects onto both G and H, both finite groups. And the Jordan Holder series of G and H have nothing in common. Then automatically you onto the product for free. That's the kind of thing I like. Things that are for free like this. And because the alternating group is simple and the symmetric group is essentially simple, there are no uh, factors that are relevant here and you get for free that we own to the product. And now we really start to have a serious form of approximation for Markov equation. Because we can do products and we can do prime powers and that's uh, we modular the starting point which we haven't completed we only know that full but very few exceptions there should be no exceptions that's very pleasing and this immediately solves long-standing problems of uh, of Rubenius, for example, he asked if you make Markov numbers, Markov numbers, a number which has a coordinate which is the solution to the Markov equation, the very Markov equation that I've been talking about in the last five minutes. So these are numbers that people have speculated and looked at for years and years uh, and very, very hard to say much about them other than the growth rate. But Frobenius immediately uh, observed congruences that they must satisfy, for, for example, if P is three mod four, uh, and P is mod three, then uh, any Markov number cannot be zero plus minus two thirds mod P. The question is, is that the only obstruction? And the answer is our uh, strong approximation conjecture certainly implies it. That means we proved this conjecture for very many primes, but until you, uh, maybe there's a way of doing this without proving the full strong approximation. But uh, it's a beautiful problem and we have a partial answer. We can use this to serve and to prove something about Markov numbers. I'll skip that, except to say that that does use some work uh, of Mirza Khani where the interpretation of the Markov triples is in terms of uh, in terms of closed geodesics on the modular surface in order to do the counting. So the number of Markov numbers up to T is about T squared. It's very lacunary. And you can ask questions about are there infinitely many Markov primes? That seems way too hard, but we can show that almost all Markov numbers are composite. All right. 
uh, I have, I think, three or four minutes. Uh, so I need to say something uh, about where this is going. I was going to say something, and I'll, if people ask questions, I'll come back and say something about the proof because uh, the, the proof, at least of this Bogan and Gambit paper uh, result that we have, uh, uses uh, finite fields and uses something beyond the Riemann hypothesis. I would like to emphasize that. But what is the general setting? I promise that so I must finish with that. So really, uh, this is a very special, this cubic equation is very special. It's uh, a very special cubic with many points of view, even as a modulized space, and that's what allows us to study it. And as I said, I like the idea of getting exotic examples. And this fits into a completely general theory that if you look at the fundamental group of a surface of genus G with n points. You look at the representations in SL2 and then you divide by conjugation. That's called the character variety. Turns out that that variety is always defined over Z, just like the case of the one's puncture torus, which gives exactly the Markov uh, equation where the K, this was asked earlier, where the K is the trace of the boundary component of the punctured guy, because the, the element that the, the two by two matrix, the, it's trace for the puncture is the number k. And the mapping class group becomes a Markov group and it takes integers to integers and all this is true in general. So you could ask, is the action of the mapping class group on the integer points, does that produce to finitely many orbits? And uh, J. Wang, I call him Peter Wang, in his Princeton thesis from a couple of years ago, made two big steps at least two big steps in this direction. Firstly, before you start to say that your variety is a threshold case, like the case of three variables, as I explained it in simple terms, the right way to understand whether the variety is in the threshold is it being log calabia, meaning it's just uh, in the situation where individual points could go either way. It's not finite by conjectures of Voita, but it's not rich yet because uh, the number of variables. And that's connected with uh, taking the variety, the affine variety, its compactification, and looking at some properties which are called local in terms of the divisor at infinity and the canonical class at infinity. 
And he proves that these character, relative character varieties of local RBL, which shows that we're in the same position. And the uh, more striking theorem, even beyond that, is he shows that you can do a full descent on the integer points, uh, act with finitely many orbits. Essentially shows that. And unlike the case of Mordell and Co. You can't do the reduction by, at least we don't know how to do the reduction by simple starting with a point and say, I'll find a simpler point. He uses differential geometry and nonlinear harmonic maps to find the reduction. Use nonlinear differential geometry, which is, I've never seen used in Dyson equations before. So these more character varieties, these higher character varieties, uh, offer a set of integral uh, affine in varieties for which integral points are very rich and which are at the threshold and need to be understood. Uh, there's much to be done to put it in the same category as understanding of, of, of the Markov. All right, uh, the real question here is uh, the, mark, the mapping class group acts on these varieties and the real points that uh, work of Goldman on the complex point and Thurston and Goldman. And on the periodic points, I'm telling you this seems to be a very rich Theory and, uh, on the integral, periodic integral points, it seems to act minimally, at least in the genus one and n equals one case is true. Concerning finite orbits, there's some work I've run out of time. I just want to end with the following. And this is very important. In diophantine geometry, when you work over the integers, uh, you, if there's something to be stable, it should be true that whatever you do over Z also works over S integers or over integers of a number field. And while some of what we do generalizes to a number of fields, I want to emphasize immediately that the decision and finiteness of orbits fails. And that's because when I increase the ring, so I'm looking at Markov equation of Z1 over 5, Z root 2. I increase the ring, I don't increase the group. The group is a group of symmetries. And so all of a sudden it becomes <laughs> deficient compared to what the ring size is. And so this feature uh, is lacking and it's the thing we're working on hardest right now, and unfortunately, we haven't quite understood everything. But uh, that is needed before I would say that we have a theory of Markov equations of the S integers. I'll end with one problem that 
when the, you in, increase the S integers, something fantastic happens. And let me end with a question, which is very similar to some of the three cubes. And I'll just challenge you that there and leave it. And uh, our techniques relate this in the two by two case rather than three by three case. So here's a simple question, which I don't even know if it's true or false, just like some of the three cubes, you can say one way, the other way, argue, you can change your mind daily. Take three by three integer matrices. It's known that the commutator subgroup of SL3Z is everything. Every, the group generated by commutators is everything. So the first homology group is trivial. But you could ask, is every element a one commutator? Is it true that you can solve the following equation in three by three integer matrices X? You give me B, is it true that B can be written as X, Y, X inverse, Y inverse? There's no local obstruction. That's a beautiful theorem. There's no local obstruction in any finite quotient and every finite quotient is congruent, so there's no local obstruction. So is this true or false? Thank you. And sorry for going over the time. I hate people who go over the time. <laughs> Well, you would like to unmute and uh, clap. It's a great time for it. Thank you so much.